some of us that we may not have had the best relationship with our daddies. We may not even know our daddy physically, a human daddy. But there is one. Oh, there is one. Your natural daddy may have let you down. Your natural daddy, he may have even failed you. He may not have been there for you. Oh, but there is one. There is one. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. He is the one that is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the one who is never changing. He never, ever fails. He is perfect in all his ways. He works everything, the good, the bad, the ugly. He works everything together for our good. Lean into your Abba. Lean into that heavenly Father. Start with the bridge.
mercy of God, that your mercy and your loving kindness is fresh in you every day. And we thank you for that, Abba. Thank you, Lord. Yes, amen, right? It's good to gather with you this morning, amen? And it's also good to sing of his goodness and his mercy and his love. He loves each and every one of us, and you need to tell yourself that, that I am loved by you, Father. You need to speak that out. I am loved by you. There are people that don't feel loved, and sometimes we're unlovable, but he loves us, and we want to honor him today in giving this morning. Uh, James says that every good and perfect gift come down from him. From the Father of lights. Every good and perfect gift. And Psalms tells us that, uh, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. What a difference he makes in your life when you, when you yield to him, when you give everything to him. What a difference. What a difference it is to wake up in a home with peace and joy and happiness. Amen? That is good. That is good. Father, we honor you today as we come to bring our tithes and our offerings, our alms in today. And how good it is to sing of your goodness this morning. Truly, you are faithful to us. More than we deserve, God, you are faithful. And God, we, we desire that uh, we keep getting closer to you. You keep drawing us. Keep drawing us closer to you. God, that we can know you in a more intimate way. And then we can walk out your word, what you tell us to do, God, that, that we will live that way. Father, we bring these tithes and offerings this morning in honor uh, of obedience and worship to you. And we ask for your blessings over them in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. What a great time to be in the house of the Lord. To worship, celebrate, give Him praise. How many of you got something to praise the Lord for today? He says... He says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. You say, well, you know, I don't know. I don't really, I can't think of a lot of things. How many of you know that we should praise God things or not? Bless his name, give him glory because we have breath. If we don't praise him. He's going to get praised. Did you know that? He's going to get praised. So I want to praise him. I don't want anything to steal mine. Just a couple announcements. Out on the table, there is a sign up there for the Bethesda informational class that is this afternoon at 4 o'clock. And we want to encourage everybody here, if you're new... And you want to know more about Bethesda and what we're about, that, that time is for you. If you're here and you're not a member of Bethesda, but you want to be, uh, maybe you're a young person, you've not done that yet, um, you can go to that class and then we can discuss that. But uh, we want to encourage everybody that has not done that to sign up today and um, be a part. Some of the young people have come up to me today and said, can we, are we able to do that? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Man, we, we want you to do that. You know? Isn't that great that young people would come up and ask that? And I tell you what, if you don't know it already, we have a lot of really good young people. 
We, I thank God for those that labor and work with our teenagers and young people, our children's ministry people. We're blessed here at Bethesda. Yeah. And I thank God for them. So sign up on that sheet today. And then also there is another sheet that's out there in two weeks, two Sundays from today. Um, not next Sunday, the Sunday following, we will be having our gifts class. And uh, if you want to discover more about what God is having you to do or wanting you to do, what kind of gifts and things that you have in your life, that class is for you. So that you can get plugged in to do what God is calling you to do. Amen? Amen. Let's, let's take a moment here. Let's all stand up and let's go around, high five, shake hands, welcome somebody.
Praise the Lord. Is that where you're at today? Is that where you're at today? I'm not here for things. I'm not here for stuff. I'm not serving you, God, to get. I just want you. You know, just being sorry, though, is not enough. Did you know that? Just being sorry is not enough. It takes repentance. A repentant life. Crying out to God. Confessing your sin to Him. And turning away from it. And going in the opposite direction. Amen? Pressing in toward Him, knowing that He is the author and the finisher of your faith, and that nothing else will suffice. You see, sometimes I think we live in 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 a mindset that there's other things that make us happy. But we all know, don't we, that things don't make you happy. If things made you happy, there would be a lot more happier people on the earth. But things don't make you happy. Earthly things don't suffice. But what makes us people of peace And joy is Him. The Lord says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Quiet yourself and let the peace of God that passes all understanding witness to you that I am the God who changes things. Psalms 46, a little lengthy passage here, 1 through 11, he says, now listen, God is our refuge and strength. Who is? God is. He is a Very present help in trouble. Who is? God is. is. It didn't say, it did not say my family is. It did not say the church is. It did not say that my job is. It did not say that my bank account is. It said that God is a refuge and strength to me. And that God is a very present help in trouble trouble therefore not because of things not because of stuff not because of Sarita not because of life not because of preachers not because of church not because of things therefore because God is all of this I will not fear Even though the earth be removed, even though everything around me is falling apart. How many of you, how many of you got your eyes wide open? Huh? Anybody here got your eyes wide open? Can you see? Even the pagans can see that things aren't so hot. Do you have your eyes wide open that you can say, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the sea, in other words, it's destruction. Mm. 
Though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah, there is a river, come on, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. Man, we are walking in the city of God. We live, dwell, exist in the kingdom of our God. The holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High God. He is tabernacling with us. The Lord wants to dwell and live in our lives. He wants to make his abode there. He wants to dwell there. He wants us to understand that he is our king and our refuge. That he is the strength of our life. If he is that, then whom do we fear? This river flows from the throne of God and whosoever will can live in it. He says, this city, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just as the break of dawn. It says, the nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. That ought, man, somebody ought to shout about that somehow. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Woo! Yeah. Glory, hallelujah. I shall not be moved. I shall not be moved. Though war is raged against me, I shall not be moved. When my enemies and my foes come up to eat my flesh, they're going to stumble and fall. Why? Because the Lord of hosts is with me. The King of glory is with me. The God who is mighty and strong is with me. I want to try to encourage us today. I just felt like I got something I want to speak on, but I think I'm going to wait until next week. But I want to encourage us this morning. I want us to realize who we are and not get caught up in all the religiosity and traditions of men. <laughs> Don't, don't you really want to be what we say we can be? Huh? Do you, do you, do you, are, you, are you getting me? All these things that I've just rattled off in this verse, don't you want that to be a reality in your life? Don't you want that to be what, it really, what really is happening in your existence? It's the truth. This is the truth. This is the truth. These are the truths of the truth. Did you hear me? These are the truths of the truth. Jesus is the truth, and these are his truths. And anybody who belongs to Jesus, these truths that are, that are spoken over God's children are for us. They're ours. We ought to lay claim to them and not just lay claim to them, 
Man, we should walk in them, live in them, talk them up, proclaim them, declare them with a loud voice that we are His children and His royal blood flows through our veins. That we are king's kids and that we are citizens and residents of the kingdom of God. Not in the hereafter, but in the right now on this earth. Kingdom power rule. At this present time. But we have to hurdle over some well-established church doctrine in order to get to the truth because we can identify in the times that we live in these church traditions, things that we have been preached to, that I have preached in past times, we have to begin to look at it and say, hold on a second, that hasn't worked. And we look at a church history that is, that is void of the power and glory and majesty of God. And we ask ourselves, why? And then we make our excuses for ourselves. Well, I'm not perfect. I fall short. Hello? Th that is true. We are not fully mature yet. Anybody in here um, think you're fully mature? This, if you do, let's open the Bible up, take a perfect look in the law of, of the Lord and, and come away from there going, whoa is me but it's kind of like asking God a question or questioning God we can how many of you know God does not mind it when his kids come and ask questions does anybody in here as a parent mind when your kids come and ask you questions you know dad you know mom I just can't understand why we're doing it this way you know, Dad or Mom, I can't. I, I'm, I just got a question. Why are we doing that? Or, 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 or uh, isn't there another maybe way we can do that? Jesus said to the Father. He asked the Father in the garden there when he was going through all this stuff. He asked the Father a question. Is there any other way? Right? That's different than saying, who do you think you are doing it this way? There's a difference in asking a question and questioning or budding everything. Some of us are um, butts. <laughs> oh, man. You got to admit, man, that was good. That was, that was all right. I'm going to talk about, it's hard to get going after that. I'm going to talk about next week some other stuff, but um, because next week I'm going to preach a message on the kingdom of God versus Christianity. And I'm going to have a subtitle called, I Accuse Christianity. We're going to have a little chit chat on that. But today, I, I just want to, I want to talk to us just for a moment on the fact that be still and know that I am the Lord. You know, you know how you can be still and know that he is the Lord? Is really move into the kingdom. Really see the kingdom. That's what it's all about, right? It's the gospel of the church. It's the gospel of the kingdom. And so the question is then, how can I get into the kingdom? And, and just real quick, we know the answer to that, right? In order to become a citizen of the kingdom, you have to be born into the kingdom. Jesus said it to Nicodemus, did he not? 
Nicodemus said, and Nicodemus asked the question, Lord, how do I get into the, your kingdom? And Jesus said, Nicodemus, here's how you get into the kingdom. You have to be born again. And Nicodemus got it. We, we want to try to say Nicodemus didn't have a clue what Jesus was talking about. No, he had a clue. He knew what Jesus was talking about. He just was a little confused on the process. And, and Nicodemus said, how then, if I have to be born, how again, how then do I get into my mother's womb a second time? But we all know why, because we're looking back. How many of you know sometimes we act so arrogant? Like, you know, we act so arrogant, like, you know, oh my goodness, Nicodemus, that was so stupid. And the only reason we can say that is because we're looking back. We're looking back. You know, Jesus says, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they're thinking in their heads, oh my goodness, that's cannibalism. And we're looking back going, that's so stupid. They were dumb for doing that and saying that. Why did they depart? Why was that such a hard saying for them? Why was it such a hard saying to say, if you ask to go one mile, go two? We're looking back on all that, seeing all their mistakes. And then we walk around with our shoulders back, head propped up like we're super Christians. Yeah, Jeff, you won't catch me questioning God. No, I ain't doing like those dumb Israelites did. And then we turn around in our own way and we do what those dumb Israelites did. We're looking back and so we really have a pattern. He says, let that be an example to you. Of what not to do, how not to act. And so Nicodemus says, I want to enter in. Jesus says, you got to be born again. So we understand, don't we? How am I going to get into the kingdom? I'm going to get into the kingdom by being born again, by having a spiritual birth. Other words, it's not by water this time it's by the spirit this time i have to be able to understand that there was a place in my life where it was more than believing in god there was a place that came up in my life that was more than believing in a higher power there was a place in my life where i believed more than in nature there was a place in my life where i put down the belief of believing that there was some big bang out there somewhere and we just came into existence there was something that went beyond that. It went from believing with my mouth, and, but, but then believing in my heart and confessing with my mouth, He is the King. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's different than this church system that we've created. And the church system, see... You can say you're born again, but live like you're not a citizen. But we know that in the Bible, and and here's what we've done. How many of you want every single person to be in the kingdom of God? Anybody? All of us? Sure. We all throw our hands up. Here's what we've done. Out of our zeal... We want, we want everybody to be in the kingdom of God. And so we've started stuff that's ignorant. Uh, hey, you roll men, stand up. <laughs> I like that. They jumped right up. It, you know, they could have said, well, he's not talking to us. We're boys. <laughs> oh, no, not here, man, not here. We grow men. Right. Not just men. Men of God. Right there, right there, right there. Five, five men of God who aren't going to let the devil shove them around. They're going to put their foot down on the neck of the devil and they're going to prophesy. They're going to declare the word of the Lord. Okay. I declare that over you. Let's go like this. Yes. Okay, so here's what we've done. Hey, hey, now we're going to pretend these guys are not men of God. 
They don't even know Jesus. But we've got them in this event. And, and we say something like this. Now, if you want to be a Christian, just repeat after me. Here, repeat after me. Ready, guys? Lord Jesus, I want you to come into my heart. I want you to forgive my sins. And I want you to change my heart and my mind. And I want to live for you, Jesus. And I accept you, Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And then, and then we get a little excited. Oh, yeah. Woo! Five people in the kingdom of God. Or, or 5,000 in the kingdom of God. Or, 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 uh, oh man, 100,000 in the kingdom of God. We just declared it. And I'm going to tell you right now, probably they're not a part of the kingdom of God. Because it don't make any difference how many times you pray that prayer, you're not getting in. Because Jesus said it, unless my Father draw you, you cannot enter. Unless the Holy Spirit, the governor that we have, draws you, convicts you of sin, and causes you to realize, hey, wait a minute, I'm not a part of the kingdom. I'm not a part of the citizenship of God. I'm not a son of God. I'm not there. Unless he causes you to do that, you can pray all you want to, and you will not change. You won't want to do the things of the kingdom. You won't want to walk by God's law. You won't want to be faithful. You, people will have to pull you along, prod you along. Huh? When you got to be pulled and prodded, something's wrong. Hello? And what we've done is, what we've done is we've created, and, and I, I like how Pastor Doug was telling me this morning, on something he heard, but what we have do, done is we have, we have created in the kingdom of God illegal aliens. Uh, I mean, we're laughing at that, but that's what we've done because Jesus said, you can't get into the kingdom any other way except you having birth. Any other way, you are a thief and a robber. Come on. And it, what, what's, what's, what's happened with that is then what has that created? That has created a dead, dry, stale, mediocre, powerless church. Because what we have is we have a bunch of people that we have tried to get them to do things that show that they're in the kingdom. And it's hard for them because they're bad. And you can sit down. But I appreciate you waiting. We, we, we try to do things that's outside of what God wants us to do. And, and with our traditions of men, we create trouble because we are ahead of God. How many of you know you can't get ahead of God? Do you know the Bible says it's God who calls? Hello? Hello? It's God who calls, and I tell you what, it's even more than that. It's God who calls and God who chooses. God wants us to be his sons and daughters. And, and all we have to do when we begin to realize that God is all these things that the psalmist writes about, that he is for us, all that he wants us to do is he wants us to drop our ways. He wants us to lay our weapons down. He wants us to put them down on the ground, lay them down with all the worry and the work and the things that we do. And he wants us to rest in the kingdom of God, in the power and authority of God. I don't have to work for it. I don't work 
to have peace. I rest. Rest in what? Oh, you, we, we can ask some dumb questions. Oh, you mean the Lord doesn't want me to work? He wants me to rest? So that means it's okay for me just to lay around and do nothing. How many of you know that that's not the rest I'm speaking about? I'm not talking about the, the mindset of do nothing. I'm not talking about the attitude of that, that I don't have to walk this out and work out my salvation with fear and trembling. It, I'm not talking about that I don't have to lay aside every weight and sin. It's just that I'm not dependent on me to get there. I'm resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ who came here to restore the kingdom power and authority and rule in our lives. I'm resting. I am ceasing from my labors. Because listen, when you, are a, when you are a part of God's kingdom, when you are walking in God's kingdom, you don't have to work up nothing. You're not working to become more righteous. Huh? Man, if I just do more of this, I'll, I, I'll finally be able to cross that hurdle. And I, You can't work your way into the kingdom. You can't work your way into God's presence. You can't work your way into the things of God. You rest your way into it. You cease from your labors and all your anxiousness and all your drama. And you quiet yourself before the Lord. And you allow His presence to take you in. To consume your life. I read this passage uh, month or so ago, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it again today. Matthew 6, 19 through 34, he says, do not lay up for yourselves. Now listen, how many of you believe what the Word of God says? How, how many of you believe that it's really time we start walking it? Instead of just saying, I believe it? Because I mean, we say we believe it, then we do the opposite. Hello? Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. How many of you know that we work and labor all of our lives building up treasures on earth? Huh? We, uh, don't we say that we have to walk by faith, not by sight? You st and, we, and we, again, we come back with these things. Well, Pastor Jerry, I got to work. I got to pay the bills. Right? And how many of you know God, God doesn't want us to be lazy? The Bible also says that any man that won't provide for his family is the same as an infidel. He wants us to work, but he doesn't want us to replace, uh, he doesn't want us to work and replace the kingdom message and the kingdom of God. He, he wants us to seek first the kingdom, and he says it here, don't lay up treasures. If you're working to lay up treasures, if you're working to have things in your life, if you're working in order that you might have security, you are not walking in the kingdom of God. It's going to get quieter. Uh, don't lay up treasures for yourselves where moth and rust and government and people destroy it and where thieves, government, break in and steal it. A lot of people are up to where it takes almost, it takes almost 50, half their income in order to pay their taxes and all the things that they have to play, pay, whether it's sales tax, whether it's uh, uh, the taxes on your income, Social Security, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and what do they do? They're just robbing from you. Hello? He says, don't do that. Don't, don't work. Don't labor. Don't do all that stuff because you're trying to lay up treasures for yourselves. I mean, let's face it. We're never happy. We're never content. I'm speaking to myself. I mean, for the first five or six years that Sri and I were here, man, all I would say this, man, I wish this parsonage was bigger so we could enter entertain more people. I wish this living room wasn't a shotgun blast. I, I, I wish this more open area. I, 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 man, I love, and, and I, I, got, I got to thinking about that. I got to thinking about that, and I thought, man, I, I, I shouldn't be talking like that. I should be thanking God for his provision, how he's provided, how he's made a way, how he's taken care, how he's performed his word. 
Because in his word, he said he, he makes a way where there doesn't seem to be any way. In his word, he says, I provide. He goes on, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust uh, destroys nor thieves can even break in and steal. Because, listen, for where your treasure is, there is your heart also. The lamp of the body is the eye, and if therefore the eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Because nobody can serve two masters. I want to tell you something. We have set up the church to where it's possible for them to serve two masters. Because we don't want to tell nobody the truth. We don't want to say to people the truth. You're giving all your time to store up your treasures on this earth and you're leaving your spiritual life go to waste. I I want to tell you something, young people, and your parents can come to me afterwards if they want to and they can tongue lash me for sure. But I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me. What's more important than your secular education is your spiritual growth. I'm not saying for you not to go to college. I'm not saying for you not to study those things, even though we know today college doesn't even guarantee you a job. Lots of people who have bachelor's degree, master degrees are working at Walmart. Not anything working at Walmart. Sometimes you have to do it, whatever you have to do to make you know, the things that you need to do, you go get a job. I got that. But listen, I want to tell you something right now. Your spiritual life is way more important than your natural. He doesn't speak to us to spend and invest all of our time that we would then be able to go out and get a $50 an hour job. He says to us first, no, wait a minute, you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot have two masters. You're going to hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal. You will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't do both. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry, listen, do not worry about your life, what you will eat. Or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow nor reap nor gather into barns, but yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? Come on, church, are we hearing... What the Spirit is saying to the church. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Do you know what? Solomon had everything. Did you know that? How many of you know Solomon in the Bible? How many of you know he had everything? Huh? He had flocks and herds. He had, he had all kinds of gardens and, 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 and sustenance. He He had great wealth, gold and silver and precious jewels. He was the envy of every nation. Everybody wanted what Solomon had. And then Solomon found himself lacking something. And God said to Solomon, Solomon, whatever you want, ask me and I'll give it to you. Anybody anybody in here would like to have God say that to you? But you know what, what? What would we say? If God said that to us, oh, oh, Doug, ask me, I'll give you whatever you want. Well, God, I'd really like to have a couple million dollars. 
I'd really like to have a fine new home, God. I'd really like to have a car that I don't have to fix every three or four months. Oh, God, I'd like to have a nice 401, 401, a 401 account. I'd like to have a really nice retirement thing so that I can live in the Bahamas uh, and retire in a nice beach house. Solomon, you can have anything you want. He didn't have to ask for all that other stuff, but he asked for this. He asked for wisdom. How many of you know, how many of you know Solomon was pretty wise? But did he, really, did he really have the wisdom he needed? Huh. Well, let me tell you the wisdom that he had at the end of his life. He looks back on his life and he says, I had, I had handmaids and maidens and, and male servants and female servants. I had a, a, a thousand uh, concubines and 300 wives. I had wealth beyond measure. I had everything that you could possibly ask for. God gave me wisdom to, to sit here and to direct this people. He said, but when I got down to the end of my life, I looked back and all it was was vanity and vexation of spirit. It was tormenting me. Because what did he do? He stored up treasures on earth for somebody else to fight over. Instead of doing the things God would have him to do. He says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. See, he doesn't say that we don't need them. He doesn't say, oh, stop talking about it. You don't need them. Don't bring up housing. How many of you know sometimes we'll bring up something, even though we know God's going to provide? He, he didn't say that, oh, I'm not saying you don't need these things. He says your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. It's necessary. We don't want to run around. How many of you know, well, today you could get by with it. I was going to say, how many of you know we can't run around with no clothing on? But I mean, today you can do every stupid thing under the sun that you couldn't do when I was a kid and you get away with it. You can, you can jump up and down on a police car and smash windows and burn down buildings and not go to jail. Hello? You can riot and destroy and destruct and say all kinds of vain and vulgar and nasty things. You can be the most immoral person in the world and get by with it. Hello? You can go to school today and you can stand up and cuss out your teacher and you can tell them what you will do. You can go into school today and tell them that you're a furry and that you need some kind of little uh, uh, place over here for you to, and they'll, uh, they'll let you do it. You need a, uh, what is that box at the, litter box. And they'll, they'll get you one. Hello? You can get by with anything. You can do all kinds of stuff. But he says, hey, don't worry about your clothing. Doesn't your heavenly father know you need these things? How many of you know the father knows that today, after church, we need to go eat? Unless you're fasting. But I'm not fasting. God knows I'm going to go eat. But guess what I know? He's provided. He makes a way. So I'm not sitting around going, oh God, please, as soon as church is over, let me go somewhere to eat. Oh God, please, Lord. Please, God, today, have Laura bring to me Her collard greens that she makes, God. <laughs> Father, let her think about me sometime this week and say, I'm going to make Pastor Jerry collard. God. <laughs> Lord, have Laura take out the earplugs out of her ears, God, so she can hear your spirit tell her.
God's going to provide. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God. In other words, you first have to become a citizen of the kingdom and his righteousness or his rightness. Listen, I'm out for his righteousness, his rightness. I'm not out for me to become more righteous because the more I allow him to control my life and move me where I need to go and what I need to do, he causes me to dwell and to walk in his righteousness. I'm not righteous because I prayed some prayer. I'm not righteous because I go to church. I'm not righteous because I tithe and give my offerings. I'm righteous because of his rightness and his glory that dwells dwells in me all things that we already know right seek God his kingdom his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you okay I'm in the kingdom of God everybody in here just loft up your hand are you in the kingdom of God Okay, look, we're, we got it all down pat. We just automatically raise our hand. Yes, I am. Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya. Ooh. Somebody feel that? You say you're making fun. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> Seek first his kingdom. Seek first God. Love the Lord your God with all. Hey, God, hey, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And they're going, yeah, wow, I do that. And then he, 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 catches them in, he, he catches them in the rib cage. He says, oh, uh, hold on a minute. And the second one's likened unto it. If you really love me, the second one won't be no big deal. Love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, man, I like that loving God business. And Man, you seen my neighbor? You want me to love that? That's what I just said. Love your neighbor, your near ones, and those around you. As yourself, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And then he says this, when you do that, when you're a part, when you're a citizen, when you're a son, when you're walking in the air as an heir, as a joint heir, and the things of the kingdom, when you do that, when your focus is on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, when you're doing that, and you're living it, and you're walking it, he says this, don't worry about don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry of its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Wow. You mean to tell me, God, if I actually, if I seek after your kingdom first, I don't have to sit around and worry about tomorrow? Will I have my job? Will I pay the electric? Will I have food on the table? I don't have to worry about none of that. He says, absolutely, that's right. You don't have to worry about that. Why? Even the Gentiles, the pagans seek after that kind of stuff. But I'm telling you, those that are in my kingdom, they don't have to worry. Because I am Jehovah Jireh. I am your provision. He will provide. He will make a way when there seems no way. Right? He is my refuge and strength. But I want to ask you something. I want to, I want to declare something to us here, and this is for all of us. How do we know that we're not seeking first the kingdom? Pastor Jerry, of course I seek first the kingdom. I'm a Christian. Oh, really? I think it's like 78% still, even in this wickedness that we're enduring right now, 76% of people in the United States of America still lay hold to claiming they're a Christian. How many of you believe that? 
How, how do we know? How do we know? Before I was a Christian, I want you to know something. Before I served God, man, I stood in life before this huge mountain, and I couldn't get anywhere. And, 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 and you know, it wasn't that the, this that God created wasn't beautiful. It's just that these things in my life that were surmountable, and I looked and I said, okay, I got I to gotta cross that mountain. I got to get over to the other side. I, I want you to know how many of you know that in my life, I couldn't get there. Every time I turned around, something bigger than me was in the way, something I couldn't control, a lifestyle that I have, uh, had, a, a lifestyle that I was running in, things that I was going after, I couldn't get away from it. And I would even say it to myself sometimes before I gave my heart to God, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not living this life anymore. I'm not going this route anymore. And it was just like in this picture, if you could just imagine yourself looking out there and saying, it's just impossible for me to get past all that. But how do we know when, when we, we come to church every week and we confess this before God, how do we know that we are seeking first his kingdom how do we know that we are in his kingdom and walking after god we we teach here some things i'm not going to get into it but we teach some things here man we're after a person from the cradle to the grave from the moment they're born to the grave we want to we want to help that person to become everything that god wants a a another way that we put it and say we say it is we want to take them from milk to meat So many people that are in the church, even though they may truly have been born into the kingdom, they're still sitting and wallowing around on the milk. They're still sucking on the bottle. And they're not mature. They're, they're infants. You can't, you can't correct an infant. Angel is not going to spank or correct Maisie. And I don't know, she may not even correct Azariah. For sure. But he, he, he can get it. He needs it. Because you want him to go from two... To four without the same bad habit. Hello? We know we have to grow up. We have to mature, right? We want every person. Why do we push the things we push here? Why do we say, hey, don't forget the corporate gathering. Don't be out there playing games all the time and missing the corporate gathering. Don't be out there working all the time and miss the corporate gathering. Don't be out there doing your own thing and wallowing in your own self-pity and miss the corporate gathering. Why do we say all those things? Because we just want to be mean to people? No, because we know how important it is for us to be able to do the things that we need to do in the kingdom. You cannot forsake the assembling of yourselves together and get there. You will be dwarfed. So why do we say, hey, hey, hey guys, everybody, everybody in here, sign up for First Church. Why do we say that? Do, are we getting a grant for every single person that goes to First Church? No. Does it, does it make, our, does it make our, our church look better because we can testify we got 75 people that goes to First Church? No. That's not it. But he says to us, not only do you not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, but you do it more as you see the time appearing. Anybody in here can't see the time appearing? Then why are you acting silly? Why are you isolating yourself? Why are you doing other stuff when you ought to be getting together? 
with other believers, encouraging, lifting up one another, doing the one another's of the scripture, because I can't make it without you. And when you separate yourself from me, you're not just hurting yourself, you're hurting me. That's why we do it. Why do we talk about, why do we talk about, man, get into classes, get into school of ministry? Why do we talk about that? Because we just want to take up as many days of your time as we possibly can. Try to make you as miserable as we can. No, we don't want you to be ignorant. Do you know how many people have been in church all their lives and they're still ignorant? They only have embedded theology. They only know what they've heard. They've never really studied something out for yourselves. That's why churches today are still legalistic. That's why they still try to legislate righteousness. That's why churches still try to tell people, don't put a ring on your finger because if you do, then you're disobeying scripture. And they quote these scriptures, let the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, shame face and in sobriety, not the wearing of gold, plating of hair, putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden person of the heart. They try to pound you to death, trying to make you feel guilty if you've got a ring on your finger. When we all know, if you study the scripture, that's not what he's talking about. If it was, then we wouldn't put clothes on. If it was, it would only be the women, not the men. But it's not what he's talking about. He's talking about what the heart of the matter really is. He's talking about the condition of your heart. He says to the women, you can't win your husband by decorating yourself. I thank God for my wife. But I'm going to tell you what, she didn't win my heart because she decorated herself or because she had fine linen on. And she didn't win me because she could cook, because she couldn't. First thing she made me was a hamburger. <sighs> brown on the top, brown on the bottom, and red as blood in the middle. But I'm going to tell you right now, man, with everything that lied within me, I ate every drop of that hamburger. And when I got done, yeah, I had to repent later. I lied. And I said, that was a great hamburger. Honey. And then I said, God, help me. As Sri and I go forward here, not to lie to her ever again, but to tell the truth even when it hurts. Me. <laughs> how do I know? How do I know? How do I know that I'm in the kingdom? Sometimes before Jesus, we were standing in front of that mountain. But here's the deal. i tell you how we know we're not walking in the kingdom. Because we walk in fear. Fear of failure. Fear of not making it. Fear of not having enough. Fear of losing my job. Fear of losing my 401k. Fear of losing my status. We walk in fear. How do we know we're not walking in the kingdom of God? Because... We live with anxiety. We don't have just blips or moments. We have a lifestyle. Man, some people I talk to, they're worried about something all the time. They're living in anxiety. Today, even in the church, we have to take pills to wake up, pills to go to bed, pills to make it through the day because we're living in anxiety. But God says, if we walk in the kingdom, he says, be anxious for nothing. Is that the truth or not? How do we know we're not walking in the kingdom because we live in doubt and unbelief? How do we know we're not walking in the kingdom? We have anger issues. Oh, but Pastor Jerry, now come on. The Bible tells us to be angry and sin not. Well, that's just it though. We don't get angry at a situation and then forgive and forgive, forget and go on. We hold it against them. We hold grudges. We're mad for days. And we say it's okay to be mad for days. It's okay for us to have broken relationship for days. I want you to know that's a lie out of hell and you need to cast that thing down. Bible says that I'm supposed to walk in the spirit. I'm supposed to have prayer. 
What, am, what is it I'm praying? Father, let me forgive those who, uh, forgive me my debts as I forgive those who trespass against me. How fast does God forgive me? Does God say, oh, no, I'm, ho- no, I'm not talking to you for days. Oh, no, he doesn't do that. He forgives me right now, doesn't he? Because his grace is sufficient. When I come to him with my whole heart, but not us, we walk in anger. How do I know I'm not walking in the kingdom because I live in drama? There are lots of people in the church, they should have their own reality TV show. Hello? I'm serious. I I, I know this may make some people feel bad, but I'm just telling you right now up front, you hear me online, you're hearing me here. Some people just ought to have their own reality show, and I'm telling you what, they'd make millions. They, you want to be a millionaire? Some of you, come talk to me. We'll set it up. Let's get your own, let's get your own reality show. I mean, if, if, if Mama June can have her own reality show, some of y'all can have your own reality show. Anybody seen Mama June advertised? I hope to pray to Jesus that none of y'all watch that trash. If you want to talk about sin, go watch Mama June. Your life will be full of trash. Or, or the Kardashians, or, or life, life during lo- love during lockup, or love after lockup. I mean, you talk about some of the stupidest stuff on the face of the planet. Listen, some of you, come to me. We can talk. I can help you. I can be your manager. Because you live your whole life in nothing but drama, 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 drama. You can't even carry on halfway conversation with people or me without going into some kind of big issue you're facing. Come on. Come on, this is the truth. Well, I'm going to tell you what. You are not walking in kingdom power. You are not walking in kingdom authority. If every time you walk, every time you do something, the devil is beating the stuffing out of you. We can lie to ourselves all we want to and say, well, it's just because of how spiritual I am. <laughs> no, man, if you were so spiritual, you'd put him under your feet when he came knocking. If we were so spiritual, we wouldn't let him get away with it. We'd punish him. We'd put him down. Man, we'd run him off. He'd be fleeing us so fast he wouldn't know what hit him because we'd be coming after him. And we'd be quoting the scripture. He didn't give me no spirit of anxiety, but of peace and of love and of joy. He didn't give me all these issues. You can't whip me because God's greater in me than he that's in you. Man, we would put him underneath our feet and we would stomp him into the carpet. But instead, we wallow for years. You're not walking in the kingdom. How do we know we're not walking in the kingdom? We murmur and complain. Anybody ever murmur and complain? We live in grumbling and gossip. Man, some people just love to talk. Huh? I know, I know. Those of of us that are spiritual, we've kind of cleaned the the talk up a little bit. We use Christian church terms like, hey, listen, not talking about Pastor Jerry, but you really need to pray for him. He's, you know, you know. I don't got to spell it out, do you? You know Pastor Jerry. But man, I love him. I love him. I love him. I just love him. Let's pray for him, though, because he's, you know, we clean it up so that it's more spiritual. But gossip, murmuring, complaining, whining, tearing down stuff that other people are doing. Do you know that we have actually had people who have got together and made light of the schools that we have operating here? Do you know they don't think we know it? Do you know that when you run your mouth, somebody's going to find out about it? <laughs> Even those that you don't you ran your mouth about and you don't want them to know. Do you know how many times people have ran their mouth and it always comes back somewhere somehow? They tear down other people. They tear down other people's works. They tear down other people's things. They, they, they come against it. They talk about how they disagree and how, oh, that's not how I see it. Well, you know, why don't you come to those who you can help change if you are so confident that you have it right? 
How do we know we're not in the kingdom? We live as an accuser of the brethren. How many of you know that when he talks about the accuser of the brethren, he's not just talking about Satan? Anybody in here? Anybody in here want to be one of those accusers of the brethren? No, we don't want to do that, do we? You know you're not walking in the kingdom when you can't see your provision. When your provision's not there. Why? Because the provider's not providing because you're not seeking him. We know we're not walking in the kingdom when we don't have contentment. We know that we're not walking in the kingdom when we are not content with the things of God. Now listen, I'm saying all that, and some of you are sitting there going, come on, man, everybody has this once in a while. Yes. All of us at times hit a speed bump. All of us at times. See that little thing right there? That's called a, that's called a speed bump. It's in parking lots. It's in different places. Why? Because they don't want you to be going 150 mile an hour. How many of you know every one of us, we've traveled over those speed bumps? But I don't know about you, but uh, yesterday, for example, I was traveling home and there was road construction and they took it down to two lanes and uh, I, 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 uh, they were still flying though in the fast lane. I mean, they were, it was supposed to be down to 50 mile, 50 mile an hour and they were still chomping at the bits and wanting to go 80. And so I moved over into the other lane. And when I got over in the other lane, this was, this was my ride. I found out why nobody was in that lane. I mean, I thought oh, my car was going to fall completely apart. I thought, I thought, I'm thinking in my head, Lord, how, how many miles do these tires have on it? Shocks and struts and... And I mean, it's the lane you're supposed to be driving in, but, and I quickly got over another lane. And you know what? If I had to, I went 80. I wasn't getting back over another one. Listen, listen. That's how some Christians live. They, didn't, they don't hit a speed bump. Their whole life is a speed bump. Do you hear me? Their whole life's turmoil. And yet at the same time, they want to talk about how connected to God they are. Listen to me, listen. We all fight battles. We all hit speed bumps now and then. We all have potholes that we run over. I I'm glad I got a GPS, and even though I know how to get home, I still turn my GPS on when I'm traveling because it tells me things like, policemen up ahead. It tells me things like, there's debris in the road. There, there's something in the road that you need to pay attention to, like, like a pothole. Everybody in here, everybody in here, we hit a pothole now and then. Because we're not perfect, we're not fully mature. We hit a speed bump now and then. But I'm going to tell you what, if you're walking in the kingdom of God, your whole life is not a pothole. Your whole life is not a speed bump. But what is it? It's, it's, it's this. When you're in the kingdom of God, then you are after the presence of God. And in the presence of the king, there is perfect peace. Even when things aren't always going well, you have the peace of God that passes all understanding. When my eyes are on Jesus, they are off of darkness. And they're not focused on everyone and everything. Folks, it's time. It is time for us as the church to stop playing. It's time for us to be what we say we are. It's time for us to put away foolish things. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. And when I spoke like a child, I got away with it because I was a child. But when I become a man, I put away childish things. Hebrews 5.12 tells us when you ought to be teachers, you have need for someone to teach you 
the very elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ, because you are unskilled in the word if you're still on milk. Doesn't mean you don't have any word. It means you're unskilled in it. I've talked to a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge, but they're not skilled in the word. They don't have revelation. They don't see. They're not deepening themselves. They can't get free from junk. They still live in the same messes they've always lived in. You have to ask yourself, man, I don't want that anymore. I want out. And what do you do to get out? You dive into the things of God. You surrender totally to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Stand with me this morning. You quit giving place to the devil. You stop making excuses for yourself. And you stop trying to project yourself in something that you're not. How many of you know confession's good for the soul? When we confess, you know what? I realize, I realize I'm just not all that. One, we speak good things to ourselves. We speak volumes to other people. How many of you, how many of you, you look at this generation and you say, oh, man. Huh? How many of you? Come on, raise your hand. We look at this generation and we say, oh, man. Sometimes, how many of you, how many of you have looked at your own kids and said, oh, my goodness. Not, not you that have little kids, but when you get, they get older, <laughs> crying out loud. I can remember when my boys were teenagers, I was going around going, oh my goodness. Son, you say that to me again, and guess what? I'm going to take you out. I told my oldest son one time, I said, son, you keep acting like that, and I will take you out of the world, and then I'll make another one look just like you. <laughs> and I did. Didn't take him out, but I made another one look just like him. <laughs> Sometimes you just, you, 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 you sit back and you question and you look at this. And how, it makes you mad, don't it? Does it make you mad looking at this generation? Does it make you mad when you look at this world and the shape it's in? Does it make you aggravated when you look at this? Come on, does it? Go like this. Does it make you mad? Does it make you mad? Huh? Well, look in the mirror. It's your fault. That's why some of you didn't want to raise your hand and wave it. You knew what I was going to do. <laughs> oh, yeah. If your kids are acting in a way and you just don't like it, maybe you need to be discussing about how your discipline's working. Well, Pastor Jerry, I, I'm not really into that kind of discipline. I'm more into gentle parenting. <laughs> gentle parenting. Sometimes I'm gentle. And sometimes I'm gentler. <laughs> In the way of a... We, we have to look at this generation because this generation is just a product of their environment. This generation is a product of parents who didn't commit themselves to the Lord. This generation is a product of parents who in the home did not show them the righteousness of God. This generation is, a, is because of the parents in their home that didn't show them the right ways to do things and the wrong way to do things and then confess to them they were wrong. This belief system that we have is because of parents allowing allowing people to go in a direction, their families to go in a direction that was contrary to the kingdom of God. This generation is the way it is because parents allow kids to believe there's something that's more important today than church. You say, oh, I'm not telling them that. Yes, you are by how you act, how you do. One of these days, they're going to be telling you how unimportant church is. What you make optional today will become of no importance to them tomorrow. Hello? 
You know, that's why you guys love me so much. I know it is. Because you know, I'm, you know whether you like it or not, I'm telling the truth. Somebody said one time, well, I was force-fed church all my life, and I ain't doing that to my kids. Well, I was force-fed it too at 18 years old. But I'm going to tell you what, what I was force-fed was going to church out of legalism. If I didn't go to church, I was going to hell. That's not what I'm talking about. But when you teach your kids how important this fellowship is, how important the things of God are, more important than anything else you're going to do on this earth, it's more important when you teach your kids that. They're not going to not want to come. They're going to want to be here. Mm. It's time for us to change how we're doing. You know, it's, it's funny, because I, I, have, I have the service on while I'm doing this, and sometimes after church, if I don't go back and watch it, or I miss it, I don't see it, I wonder, you know, when I'm doing some things or saying some things, how do people think about that? And I just watched myself, <laughs> I just watched myself go through that, and I was going like this, and it looks pretty stupid. I mean, it looks pretty dumb, Pastor Doug. <laughs> I'm just think I'm thankful there's volume that goes with it. <laughs> oh. Lord, help me, Jesus. How many of you believe time's short? Then why are we going after the things of this life when we know it's about to end? Why is that what, why is that what dra- driving us? Why do we push our kids toward things that we know is coming to an end? It's not going to matter. When you look at just where our country's come since the very first term of, well, you can go back further than this, but for us that are in church life, the very first term of President Obama. You can go back to the bushes, though, and keep on going back. They were all, like, asleep at the wheel. But President Obama, in his first term, stood up and on an on a interview and said that he was against same-sex marriage. That he was okay with, he was okay with um, civil unions. He was okay with civil unions, but he was against same-sex marriage. That marriage was between a man and a woman. By the time he got to his second term, he changed. Now, now Now, how many of you know that's bad enough? How many of you know that marriage between two men is horrible? I'm not apologizing here. How many of you believe a marriage between two women is abominable? This is. But I'm telling you, those of us that were sitting there at that time going, man, I tell you what, it's getting horrible. I can't believe these people are trying to kill a marriage between a man and a woman. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> now, we want, now we got them identifying as a man going into girls' bathrooms. Now we got all kinds of garbage going on that's way down the road. I mean, come on, folks. How can it get much worse than this? It can because the next thing is there's no longer going to be pedophilia. As long as there was some consent, it's okay if you're having sex with children under age. Hello? We look at this destruction. Look at this thing. And it's not just here. It's worldwide it's happening. What is it? When you see things that are happening worldwide, you know the end is near. So what should we as God's people be doing? Man, we should be diving in and shoving ourselves into everything that really matters, not in things that don't matter. i tell you right now, I'm thankful that my son Derek did not become a Major League Baseball player. 
I thank God that he's not a part of that stupid, filthy, abominable groups of people that are out there doing the things they're doing for the sake of themselves. There's good people there also. But for the most part, it's corrupt, wicked. They're serving other nations that hate God and hate us. What am I going to shove my family toward? What am I as a man going to push my family toward? I'm going to tell you, for me and my house, it's the kingdom of God. That's what I want to shove mine toward. How about you? Let's lift our hands up today together. If you always, always in Bethesda, if you want to come and pray, you know the altar's always open. It's always available for you to come. Lift up your hands. Somebody will pray with you. If you don't know Jesus today, Jesus wants you to begin to believe and follow him. What's the evidence of somebody truly being a believer? They follow Jesus. Not just here on Sunday, but every day of their lives. They have fruit that they bear. They're following Jesus. They follow him. They walk with him. They talk with him. They live with him. They're interested in him more than breath itself. That's what somebody who's a real believer is. Somebody's truly been born again. They want the king and his kingdom. Not just on once a week, every day of their lives. If you're in here and you don't know him that way, and that's not your desire, he's here right now. In this place, he loves you. You can make that declaration, I'm dropping everything and I'm following him. tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to back it up with my fruit. I'm going to back it up with fruit. There's evidence of those who are born again. There's evidence of those who are following Jesus. And so if you want to come and pray, whatever it is, you need healing, you need deliverance, whatever it might be, I want you to know we're here and we'll pray with you. So if you want to do that, you can come right now. The rest of us, I want us to lift our hands up, and I want you to look at yourself. Is my life an occasional speed bump? Is my life an occasional pothole? Or does it just seem like every time I turn around, everywhere I go, everything I do, I'm just running over speed bumps? Does it seem like I'm falling deeper into the potholes? And I want you to know, I'm not talking about the fact that you'd be hitting speed bumps, but you're not, you don't have any money, or you're broke, or you don't have these things. Because you can have things, you can have things and be totally lost. That's not what I'm talking about, but is your life full of peace? Is your life full of joy? Is the fruit of the Spirit evident in your life? Do people that are around you look at your actions and your conduct and your ways of speech and your lifestyle and how you conduct yourself and what you say? Do they see that and do they, are they amazed at how dedicated to God you are? If you went and told some people that you hang out with, man, I'm a Christian, I go to church, would they be in shock? Would they be like, what? Really? Or would they say, yeah, I can tell, man, there's just something different about you. What is it? Well, I've served the king of kings. Are you religious or are you truly a follower of Christ and kingdom seeker? Religiosity won't get you anywhere. Religiosity will make you miserable. Religiosity only gets you to follow a set of rules make you feel good about yourself but when you decide to follow the kingdom of God man it's totally different how your life goes and how your life is it rains on the just and the unjust alike but when I feel it's raining on me I've got Jesus the author and finisher of my faith he's more than enough so let's lift our hands up to the Lord 
and let's cry unto him and examine ourselves. Father, we thank you today for all you do for us. You are love. We thank you, God. You bring life Come on, everyone in the house, everyone in the house, you know Jesus Christ, lift up your hands. Sweet 